Breaking news, a 12-year-old girl is stabbed. The girl was lured to the area by two of her classmates who allegedly stabbed her 19 times. The girls had hoped the attack would earn them a home in Slender Man's mansion. Slender Man is a fictional horror character. We have been there for the journey. Whisper in the night dark Footsteps in the backyard Shadows dance on stained walls Blood rust every night fall Fear grips like chains tied Chasing you in moonlight Eyes gleam with twisted clay No escape from me What up home slices? What up home fries? And what up homes of other varieties? So if you've seen the hook of the video, then you know that we will be covering the Slender Man stabbing. And the reason why I wanted to cover this was obviously because you have a paranormal element and then you have true crime. And hey, if you don't know who I am, I'm Emily the Fine Art Medium. I specialize in the paranormal and I have a degree in social deviance. And so it's part of the reason why I wanted to go into this topic because there's some important things that need to be discussed. And so I'm going to provide some background information in a clip that I put together and I will be sharing some other insights and of course I have my notes and yeah so we're just gonna get right into it. Do you think Peyton had any idea? No, she had absolutely no idea. She was blindsided. Blindsided by what those two friends had in store, and they'd been planning it for months. After that night of skating, they would return to Morgan's house. Morgan's mother, Angie, downstairs. They played up in Morgan's bedroom with Morgan's dolls. I mean, it was just a normal night. And no sign that two were plotting against Peyton? No, no sign whatsoever. The next morning, Morgan asked if they could go to the park. How often would they go to the park? While we were actually, believe it or not, pretty strict parents and didn't let Morgan um, go out on her own very often. But you thought because she had her two friends, it would be safe? Mm hmm The first sign anything is wrong, a police officer showing up at Angie's door. And my heart dropped down into my stomach. Not only were there police in my living room, but they were um, wearing riot gear. Across town, officers are also arriving at Peyton's house. Around the side of the house, up over the deck, came a uniformed officer. The first thing that goes through my mind is, something has happened to somebody that I love. And they asked me, where's Morgan? I said, she's at the park with her friends. Angie Geyser says the police tell her that Morgan is missing. They think she may be hiding her daughter. They searched the house and I just kept asking, you know, what happened? What's going on? And they, they wouldn't tell me other than to say there had been an incident at the park and one of the girls was hurt. At first, police refusing to reveal which one of those girls was hurt. It would take hours to piece together exactly what happened at that birthday sleepover. The first moment anyone would begin to learn of the horror is this call to 911. 911, I'm transferring over a caller on Big Bend. 12 year old Peyton Leitner had just crawled out of the woods covered in blood, stabbed 19 times. And you can hear it in their voices. The operators cannot believe what they are hearing. He came upon a 12 year old female. She appears to be stabbed. She appears to be what? Stabbed. Stabbed? Correct. Greg Steinberg was riding his bike that morning on a path that had actually been chained off. It was pure chance. He came this way. And you were biking by, and she says to you what? Could you help me, please? I've been stabbed multiple times. I quick got out my cell phone. I was shaken. He watches as the ambulance rushes her away. And when you looked at her, it was immediately apparent she'd been stabbed multiple times. Yeah, to her chest and abdomen and arm and leg. Doctors fear she might not survive. And her mother, Stacy, has just been told that Peyton has been rushed to the hospital. She was terrified. She was crying. She couldn't breathe. But she saw you there. She saw me, and she put her hand out, and I rushed over to her, and I put my arms around her, and I laid next to her, and I hugged her, and I said, 
you're gonna be okay, it's gonna be fine. But I could see that she was covered, her arms and her legs and her abdomen, they were covered in stab wounds. There were so many stab wounds, it took two nurses to count them, 19 in all. And her little girl is now being raced down the hall. Did you say anything to Peyton as they were wheeling her away? That I loved her and that she would be okay. Peyton's mother could not believe that her daughter's friend could be capable of this. Morgan didn't do this, is what's going through my head. There's no way. There's no way that's, that's what happened. Morgan is 12. Morgan has never hurt a fly. <laughs> it was just unthinkable that Morgan would, would do anything to hurt someone else. Okay, so based off of what we've learned, we learned that Morgan was diagnosed with early child onset of schizophrenia. So let's talk about schizophrenia according to the DSM-5, and you can find this information on Google. So I'm going to provide the definition that they have here on minddiagnostics.org just because it's really well written, but I'll have all my sources linked down below. But so schizophrenia is a chronic and severe mental health disorder that affects how a person thinks, feels, and behaves. It's often characterized by episodes of psychosis, featuring delusions, hallucinations, and disorganized thinking. This disorder can be profoundly disabling, impacting daily functioning and quality of life. The DSM-5, a critical tool for mental health professionals, defines schizophrenia with specific criteria. A diagnosis requires two or more of the following symptoms present for a significant portion of time during a one month period. So number one, delusions. Number two, hallucinations. Three, disorganized speech. Number four, grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior. Number five, negative symptoms. So like reduced emotional expression is a good example but one of the symptoms must be either one two or three additionally continuous signs of the disturbance must persist for at least six months and the causes it can be genetic it can be brain structuring chemistry environmental factors developmental factors and like for treatments there are antipsychotic medications psychotherapy uh, psychosocial interventions and coordinated specialty care. So, you know, it can be managed. So with that, this is where things get a little dicey, especially when you enter realms of the paranormal and mediumship, extrasensory perception, because oftentimes mediumship and having extrasensory perception abilities can look like schizophrenia and vice versa. But the key thing with schizophrenia is you have to have multiple of the criteria to even be considered to even having it and it lasting for a certain period of time. And like mediumship sometimes can weave in and out of that as well. But oftentimes person with actual schizophrenia, they have some behavioral issues at the same time. So it's not just delusions or hallucinations. There's also some kind of behavioral element involved. One of the best ways to tell though, if you're like a medium or have extrasensory perception abilities versus schizophrenia, always, 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 always see a mental health professional. If you're not sure, don't self-diagnose Go to a mental health physician, please. <laughs> but one way you can tell is obviously go through the criteria that is stated in the DSM-5, but then also see if you can validate some of the hallucinations or things that you're seeing that other people aren't. I don't know if I would call them hallucinations until you can get that stuff validated, but if you're somebody that's questioning it, again, go see a mental health physician. But also, if you're seeing people or um, dead people or ghosts, try to uh, fact check. Validation is always the best way to know whether or not you're losing it or you have something else going on 
for me, I always questioned, at least in the beginning, I was like, okay, well, maybe I am schizophrenic. Like, what the heck? But I was able to validate a lot of the stuff that I was seeing with other people. And documentation became my best friend. Okay? I always say, write shit down. When I say that, I'm not kidding because that will make you or break you. And because I wrote things down, I didn't constantly question whether or not I was having some kind of mental health situation. Because I wrote those things down, I was able to go back in my notes and validate a lot of the stuff. And the thing is, if I wasn't able to validate any of the stuff that I had been seeing or experiencing, you better bet, you best bet I would have checked myself in. But I made sure to make certain people aware of the stuff that was going on. That way, if there needed to be any intervention, it wouldn't just be like a shock and it wouldn't just kind of come out of the blue or you know what I mean I don't know I don't know if I'm describing that right but it was like I made sure that I had people to talk to about this to see if they can help validate or to make sure that if they couldn't validate that they would bring me back down to earth and be like hey um something ain't right and you know be that little voice pun not intended okay to be that intervention if they needed to be. Because let's be real, it can get freaky deaky and navigating this journey alone is not easy. Especially like, this is why I have my channel in the first place, okay? Is for people like me that have all these experiences but like are afraid to tell somebody or I don't know, they just need support and to prove that they're not crazy. So that's, I just wanted to, you know, explain that a little bit. But then let's talk about Slender Man in of himself and the process of the artist creating this character. And is it based off a real entity? Is it a thought form? Like, what's going on with Slenderman? And could there be a paranormal element involved in this situation? Is it all schizophrenia related or mental health related? Is it strictly paranormal or is it both? I'm going to explain as we continue in this video. But I wanted to find out because based off of the things that I've personally experienced, in my mediumship journey and spirituality journey and all that fun stuff, I've seen some things. <laughs> I have seen some things. And little side note, it would be interesting if there was like any kind of, I don't know, experiment where you can get brain scans of someone going through an active schizophrenic psychosis episode and then look at the brain scan of a psychic medium like in the middle of channeling or talking to a dead person or whatever i would be interested to see what spots light up on each like person and how they differ and how they are similar i'm just curious i'm very curious i'm sure there are some differences obviously there would be some differences but i'm curious about the similarities so I did a little, a little bit of channeling and a little bit of investigation, like online research, based off of the experiences that I've had. Leading up to this point in my mediumship journey, I am very certain that the creator of Slenderman, whether it was intended or not, he was very influenced by paranormal elements whether it was stuff he read about or didn't read about and he literally had like, I don't know, like an automatic drawing or writing session and it just kind of took life on its own. But based on an interview that I did find, and I will put the links 
up here and down there. And you can watch, well, it's more of a podcast, but you can listen to it. And you'll see that he talks about tulpas. He talks about certain things in TV shows that kind of helped in the creating of the character of Slenderman. So there is some sort of paranormal element there. And the question is, though, once he created it, how did that affect the appearance of it? And I'm pretty sure that, as you know, I talk about thought forms all the time. And he even mentions tulpas, which is a type of thought form that is specifically created based off of certain characteristics you want it to have. Usually it's kind of like pre-planned in a way, whereas like regular thought forms, they're not really pre-planned. It's just they manifest through the combination of dense energy and it just takes a life of its own. But I feel like you can have everything and anything be or become the form of slender man and like you can have thought forms absolutely that look like this even before the creation of the character you can have earthies that can look like this i've seen earthies get in my face and it was you know pale face no eyes or mouth and it was very shadowy i've seen um demonic entities play on people's fears that I guess the whole idea of not having a face and just being big and shadowy is unsettling to many and negative entities like to play on your deepest fears but then you put into consideration like after the creation of Slender Man it's like if somebody reads about a character and it creeps them out, it terrifies them. Well, if they have a haunting or an attachment, that attachment will see the fears of that person and manifest into those fears. So that's another element to take into consideration. So in a way, it's like shadow people and the hat man. Like you have many different types of entities that can appear as that figure. And at the end of the day, if the entity has enough strength or abilities, regardless if, it, if it's a thought form or an earthy or a demonic entity, regardless of the entity's type, it will appear as something that will unsettle their target the most to induce the production of negative energy to feed off of. That is the goal. While I do think the character design was inspired by paranormal like real paranormal things. I do think the backstory was made up. Over many cultures and religions across the world, there are some that do heinous acts in the name of the entity, spirit, deity, whatever you want to call it. There are accounts of people sacrificing others to appease those beings. Some examples are the Mayan, Aztec, Incan cultures in Mesoamerica, those in the city of Ur, which is now present-day Iraq. There's some civilizations in China. Like, even during satanic panic, there have been serial killers that have done things in the name of Satan. There are just even crimes related to appeasing a demonic entity. So, like I said, if you're somebody with extrasensory perception, and especially clairvoyant, I am sure you've seen something similar. Well, that's where, where it gets a little tricky. But so I would say before and even after the creation of Slender Man, it is a real entity or entities. But the question is, without being known, with this type of entity being real, the question is now, was this influenced because of the entity or an entity posing as Slenderman, or was this strictly 
mental health issues? That is the question. It gets tricky because as if you're following my channel and many other medium channels or spiritual channels who talk about paranormal, children have a knack at seeing the paranormal. And it's because their egos haven't been created really yet and they're more pure in energy and psychic energy. So a lot of times, if anyone's gonna see paranormal things, it's going to be children. And they just overall have a general knack for perceiving different types of energy. Now in Morgan's case, my guide specifically told me that this was 98% mental health. This was schizophrenia because, and I'm adding to this based off of what my guide said, because I agreed, she had other issues going on aside from the hallucinations and delusions. She was having behavioral issues as well. Not to mention some of her hallucinations and delusions were kind of questionable. Like there are points where she thought she was a cat. There were points where she thought she was talking to Severus Snape from Harry Potter. There are points where she was seeing colors melting off the wall. Like the hallucinations that she was having kind of wasn't really typical for someone with extrasensory perception abilities. So I 100% fully agree that the medical professionals that took on Morgan, they had a correct or they have a correct diagnosis. Do I think there's a possibility that she might have been able to perceive spirits? Anything's possible. I mean, some of like the ink blot, dead people kind of thing, I've seen them like that too. I think there might have been a little bit, but I think overall the schizophrenia kind of like was much stronger and kind of like canceled that part out in a way. And so with her spending a lot of time online reading about creepy pastas, and I feel like a lot of it was her reading certain stories and just taking that information and then her schizophrenia, like making it more vivid and real. Now for Anissa, because remember there was a second girl involved, even though she wasn't schizophrenic, I do feel like she was still impressionable. Um, she didn't have much world experience, but if you're best friends with somebody, I mean, you're just gonna agree and not question anything that they say, especially, you know, when you're a child but so she was diagnosed with shared psychotic disorder, which, okay, I get it. But specifically, let me see. So yeah, she was diagnosed with shared psychotic disorder, which is a disorder that caused her to share delusions with Morgan she also was diagnosed with PTSD, major depression, and personality disorder. So yeah, when you have all those things combined, it gets a little tricky again. I mean, I feel like they made the right calls there in terms of that, but I'm really surprised that they were tried as adults, but I guess it had to do with the severity of the crime, which okay, I get it. And the thing is, too, they technically knew right from wrong. Now, Morgan, on the other hand, with her schizophrenia, it's hard to say. Anissa showed that she was empathetic to the situation. And so because she was able to show that, it gave her more leeway and kind of helped in their decision of letting her go kind of I mean with stipulations of course but they took her out of the facility per like permanently and so they have her under like a house arrest situation so 
Yeah, and with Morgan, the thing with schizophrenia is, while it can be somewhat managed, you still have that risk of her potentially doing something harmful to herself or other people. And so I feel like keeping her in the facility was probably a good decision. Yeah, it sucks for her and the family, but schizophrenia is no joke at all. But overall, guys, I mean, there's not much else to talk about here. So I'm pretty much going to leave it there. If you guys found this video interesting or have any comments, questions, concerns, leave it down below. I love answering you guys. Um, but I will see you tomorrow with the next one. Peace.